You're listening to The Sister Trill with Danai and Kiveli. Just a little disclaimer, um, we are starting the episode without our good microphone because we had a little bit of a technical failure and forgot to turn it on. But after about three and a half minutes, you're going to go back on the good audio quality with the good microphones. So enjoy the episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to The Sister Trill. I'm Kiveli. And I'm Danai. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I think is very current and has been current in the past few years. I think also a topic that we tend to talk a lot about at home whenever it comes up, whenever we read a headline that kind of pertains to that. We also have a younger brother who goes to school still, who definitely has to deal with those changes. And that topic, I would say, very simply, it would be called wokeness or political correctness. And we would like to kind of have a conversation about it. Um, we grew up, I think, exactly in those years where political correctness started becoming such an important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think we, when we started studying, it was still significantly less apparent how it how strongly it would then um, manifest itself in the universities and in the education system and just generally in uh, our society. And I think we both have opinions on it. (laughs) But before we get into it, let's first discuss what we disagreed on this week. Yes. Well, I have one. Okay, go. I think it's Um, the same one that I'd have. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in the past days, we've been on tour and we've been traveling. And I always uh, compared the cities that we were in to Berlin, which is the city that we live in. And I was always complaining about how hard it is in Berlin to get from point A to point B, how long it takes compared to other cities. And I always felt that you were not on my wavelength because I would say, look, now I'm traveling to a different like little village outside of Munich because that's where we were. And it's only taking me 25 minutes. And in Berlin, within 25 minutes, I don't even make it to the edge of the city. And right. I was kind of annoyed by right. those long travels yeah, within yeah. Berlin. And yeah. no, I were was justifying. I was, yeah, no, I was justifying it because I do think it, it always depends on where you travel, like how well the connection is built between the places you yeah. want to travel. And also, I don't know, I mean, I was just trying to, you know, stand up for our city, for our city no, of I choice, love it. Berlin. I love it. It's true. We I love, love Berlin. Berlin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We love Berlin. Berlin is awesome. I wouldn't yeah. want to live in any I mean, other German of, city. Of course it is. It is, you know, very, sometimes it takes very long to go from point A from point, to point B. And also I was just making the point that I think for us, we're specifically within this topic is because we really don't live in the center. Yeah. We live really far away from the center. So for us to get anywhere, basically, it's a time investment. Yeah. If we were to live somewhere in the city, you know, some location would be in under 15 minutes and then others would be like 35 40 minutes yeah, so true. but yeah berlin is awesome just, i don't want to i don't want to tear berlin down i'm absolutely totally pro berlin, not but it absolutely. is hard to move around because it's just such a huge like yes. widespread yes that's true. true it's true all right so we're back now on the actual good microphones <laughs> so yeah what i think we disagreed on is actually it happened i think about five minutes ago which is you didn't really let me nap five minutes ago so basically we are recording this episode um about an hour before we have to go on stage we have a concert tonight and um i like to well not just on concert days but especially on concert days if possible fit in a 20 minute nap because it just you know kind of brings me full of energy and and i'm then i'm super awake and um, and, and t- today you just you just had too much energy to let me nap. But that's not true. Something. That's not true. I actually left you alone. I put in my headphones mm-hmm. after you asked me to, and then I just feel like you couldn't fall asleep. Just saying. Well, it was a combination. In the Both. beginning, you were you were reluctant to even let me take the time. But it's okay. It's okay. I'm still away. All right. So let's get into the topic of wokeness. So generally, I don't really remember when I've even heard the the term woke for the first time. But I remember the first time I became aware of political correctness as like this thing as it is today. And I think it was in the, like during the Me Too movement, I would say, because the the Me Too movement hit, I was thinking, I think it was 2016, 17, or was it later? Was it 18? Ooh, uh, I'm not sure. I, f- I, would, I feel like no, a bit later, later it right? It was yeah. 18 or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I remember that, you know, that first put my... I would say that was the first time I became aware of this concept 
of, of political... cancelling someone. Okay. Um, but the first like, time of, you of punishing ever... someone by ruining their career rather than by going through the justice system. Okay, but you're talking about cancelling now. R- the, but yeah, yeah. So, so but political correctness, that's the first time you were in touch with it? No, no, that was, I think, the first time where I became aware of that trend and then associated with that trend, I became aware also through you know, becoming aware of people like Jordan Peterson and things like that about this idea that certain, like the pronouns became a thing right. that I became aware of. And then quite in my own life, I became aware of, I remember I was sitting in my gra- like bachelor graduation ceremony mm-hmm. and um, our university director was giving a speech and I quite clearly remember sitting in that same hall four years earlier or five years earlier when she was giving the kind of entrance ceremony speech yeah, yeah. and she had changed the entire way she was speaking. So when so, so German is a language that has gendered uh, nouns, like female and male versions of the same job. So you would say musician, there is musica for men and musikerinnen for girls and uh, for women. And when I started studying, she would just use both, right? Uh, girl Mm -hmm. and the girl version the boy version and when I finished studying in that um, final ceremony she was using um, musizierende which is kind of a term that that, that, music making people music Mm -hmm. making people in a way that that up to that point had never been used like Mm -hmm. in in a natural context and that's when I became like aware wow okay like it it has brought me to a place where it confronts me and now it has evolved even more into this gendered way of talking in German at least where there is a specific way you have to say the word in order to include everybody yes I mean and that that is one I mean that is you know I would say for me if, like, I've always been very, very skeptical of political correctness. Well, I wanted to say the first time I came into contact with yeah. political correctness was much earlier. And I, I was mean, still so at to, school. To today's political correctness. Yeah, right? no, not on that, not on that yeah, level. But, but I, I remember still that that was something we were talking about. And it was pertaining to dark-skinned people. Ah, yeah, um, yeah I remember that And well. I remember it was still in school. And, of course, already at that time, the N-word was yeah, not course. allowed. Yeah. But what, what we used to say back then was black. Mm-hmm. You would just say black. Mm-hmm. And then came a time when you weren't allowed to say black anymore. And then it went to dark skin. And I remember for a while there, it was maximally pigmented people. Yeah. Like, or people with maximally pigmented skin, skin. or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And I, I remember that we were kind of like, you know, making jokes, like the pupils among themselves, like, oh yeah, uh, uh, should we say there, there's a maximally pigmented or like a medium pigmented? Yes, or yes, yes. Something yes, like yeah. that. I remember that's the first time where... We were talking about, yeah, interesting, the, the nouns, the descriptions of people yeah. are changing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the reason why I've always been very skeptical of political correctness as an ideology, no matter where, you know, it's applied, because it's not only in the gender sphere, you know, I mean, you can get political correctness, I think, is also at this point, I would say it's a kind of, um, I would say, more or less agreed upon by the people supporting its set of ideals and agreed upon ideology of extreme um, non-threatening language or what they perceive as threatening language towards minorities and that is minorities of a racial kind, minorities of a, a sexual orientation kind, minorities of any kind, of a gender kind. I mean, for some reason, women are a minority in the gender. So, so it's, it, this is kind of the idea. And, and with, if you deviate from those opinions in your speech um, or in your actions... Um, then that goes against political correctness in, in, in this point in time. Like political correctness has also gotten to the you know sphere of, for example, um, not being able to um, hail George Washington's actions as someone who founded America and who wrote the Declaration of Independence because he held slaves. Like that's also political. Yeah. I, like what I would include in the sphere of political correctness. I would think you that say it, as well. Yes, I, that I, has I nothing think, to do with speech. In I general. think it's important to you know kind of start at the beginning of it yeah. because I think you already went like totally into you talking about canceling about yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. which is like all the negative sides of it. Yeah, which I agree with, and we should definitely talk yeah. about that. But I think we should maybe start with the origin origins, which are positive. I mean, the origins of political correctness are there because for a long time there were degrading terms for certain people or certain people were not represented, you know, things like that were 
true. And, you know, there are some examples, especially in the German language, where just words that are positive are male. Like, for example, the word for great in German is herrlich, which basically yes. means manly. Yes. And the and word for, it's not terrible, it's more like stupid a little bit. Yeah. Bit dämlich, like, which means womanly. Yeah. So, I mean, these things exist. Yeah, and yeah. it was... I think that's where it started to counter that. And I would even say I would political correctness also started with like political correctness coming from the conservative side, mm -hmm. which was, for example, not being allowed to use swear words on television. Right. Or yeah, things like sure. that, that's like, like not being able to use but filthy language. Yeah. Filthy but I mean, that's also to, I, for example, the swear word thing, I think if I'm not mistaken, is during daytime, right? Nighttime, you are allowed. So, for example, that's to protect little Children kids that might be watching like so that, yeah. I think the origins one shouldn't forget that yeah, just no, completely absolutely. dismiss that are well meant thoughts yeah, and, yeah. and positive and, and I think the the discussion that we should have is how did it develop yes. how did this actually positive beginning turn into what it is now yeah, and, and yeah. what is it now actually yeah. and is it uh, you know is the problem the political correctness itself Or is it what you mentioned before already briefly, the, the cancelling that goes with it, yeah. the expectations that go with it, the excluding the people that don't adhere to it? Yeah. You know, what is it actually that is the problem? Yes, yes. I think that one of my main objections to political correctness is the assumption that the only way to get people to treat each other with sensitivity and respect and grace is through forbidding a different type of conversation. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the only way to get people to, um, for example, not actively use a pronoun that another person doesn't want is not by just, you know, expecting a normal amount of decency in public conversation, but by compelling it and forbidding not to use this pronoun, you know? Yeah. So it kind of completely takes away um, natural the natural expectation of each other to be nice to each other. Not, you know, because... I mean, when it comes to pronouns, yeah. for me personally, if someone asks me to use this or that yeah. pronoun, yeah. I will use it. Yes. I won't even think about it twice. For me, it's very natural. It's being polite. It's yeah. human decency. Yeah. If whatever gender comes to me and says, please speak to me in that way... Yeah. I will do it yes. because it's a matter of respect Absolutely. to me. I mean, so <laughs> for me, if someone says I'm not willing to use your pronoun, I find that disrespectful. I, I find that disrespectful. There's also, of course, I would say a difference if you are in, if you're just meeting someone and you are... Yeah, no, he has to tell me. I can't yeah, guess yeah. the pronoun. Right. I mean, because again, there are, of course, gradations to the, for example, the pronoun issue. I totally agree with you. Yeah. If I meet someone and they tell me, I feel more comfortable if you do this and this and that, yeah. I'm going to do this and this and that. I've got no reason yeah. to not want to make them feel comfortable. That is not just the pronoun. That's anything. If they say, exactly. I feel more comfortable not speaking about this topic, then I'm not going to speak yeah. about this topic. Or even like know? with nicknames, you know, some people say, please don't use that nickname. Exactly. I don't like it. Right. Yeah, of course. I'm, yeah. But, but that's what I mean. It's common decency yeah. to that. That for me is no progressive. It's just common decency to treat. But people. of course, we are aware that there are people that are not willing to do that because they find it stupid. Now, but so now, now of course, now we, we progress. Like if someone tells me something that now that's not necessarily just pronouns, but if someone adheres to a life philosophy that I either don't trust or don't understand or cannot identify with, that person might not become, you know, my best friend. Because obviously... Of course. So, but that, that does not mean that I'm not going to treat them with respect. Of and course. Decent. Right. So, and the other thing is that for many things that we are, you know, that are on this political correctness front, I'm totally willing to, to, um, to consider that maybe the reason why I find something weird or unnatural is because I don't yet understand it or I mm -hmm. haven't come into contact with it enough to properly understand it. If, to be perfectly honest, I am going to call someone whatever pronoun they want to call themselves or they identify with, but I am also at the same time going to find it awkward. I'm yeah, going to find know, it weird and I'm, I, gonna, and I'm, and I'm, going, to, I'm going to ask myself... Does that really make such a difference for that person? Is that really where, you know, you, you take your identity from? A word rather than an action, an achievement or yeah, something. Yeah, but as you said, it's 
in the end, this is not our this decision is not our, exactly. to make. Yeah. And uh, for example, we had an experience where we both met a trans person and this person identified, actually, I, I don't know what they identified with at the time, but uh, I remember that I thought, I literally thought it was a, a boy, yeah. but then I, I don't even know what the right language is, the, the gender, or is it the, what do you say, the gender assigned at birth, exactly, mm -hmm. was girl, was female. Um, and then I remember speaking to him, her, <laughs> um, you know, with the male pronouns, because that's just what I was seeing. Yeah. And then um, his, her father <laughs> said, this is my daughter. Yeah. And then I just, and we both actually went up to her, and, you know, yeah. and said, sorry, and something. And she was super chill about it. And she just said, no, it's totally fine. Just use whatever you feel fits in that moment. Yeah. And she said, you can say she, you can say he. And, yeah. and we had this night out. And we used she. I and we used, I don't remember. I think we used but she. But yeah. what yeah. I remember is that she made me feel very comfortable yeah. yes. and very at ease because I was a bit yeah. confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was just like, it's super cool. Yeah. You know, I'm fine with both. Yeah. And it was a very natural situation. Absolutely. I didn't feel any awkward thing Absolutely. about Absolutely. that. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, when it comes to pronouns, um, as I said, it's a, it's a matter of respect. And it's also, especially now that it's still all so new, you know, mm. maybe the, the responsibility of the people that are expecting the pronouns to teach in a positive yes, way. Yes, I think you're hitting I mean, on a very, very, very good point yeah. here. Because the, you were saying before that, you know, they have to tell you the, the yeah, pronoun yeah. They, want, they want you to use. However, there is also this trend, I would say, at the forefront of this movement, mm -hmm. where it is a natural expectation, whenever you begin a conversation, to first ask the pronouns. Right. And to be honest, it's not even that much at the forefront, because I have now encountered quite some groups of friends or people or, you know, groups I meet at parties, where literally it is, or, or for example, right, Zoom conferences, mm -hmm. where there'll be the name, and then in brackets, the pronouns. Right. Yeah. And so, so it's, it's not even, you know, that far away anymore. And, and I mean, I don't know, just like because it's us talking right now, yeah? And I mean, this is not supposed to be kind of a, a public um, representation of our opinions. This is your opinion and nail myself mm -hmm. on it. And, you know, at the risk of maybe sounding ignorant or, or, or anything. What do you think about this... outbreak of 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 people that now don't identify anymore with the two genders mm -hmm. that have existed since the beginning of time do you think that a they've always existed at the same percentages and now that the tolerance has mm -hmm. gone up they finally dare to come out to the and admit yeah. it to it do you think that b kind of like you know the what, what was it this this um multiple identity uh, personality disorder that you know once it was diagnosed suddenly like broke oh yeah out, and everyone was like well what you know what is the diagnose bringing about the cases that are, you know mm -hmm. is it kind of a thing that people are are, are increasingly considering mm -hmm. these different genders because it is discussed so much and you know yeah is it a combination of the two do you think it's good do you think it is it helps the people mm -hmm. do you think that it is kind of maybe a false sense of security or yeah. underlying a different problem what do um, you think well and I, I, this is actually the next point i wanted to discuss yeah. as well well first of all i do think of course that you know trans people uh, have right. existed since the beginning of time yeah. clearly yeah. and there always have been stories you know Even of, myths exactly I mean, myths about it exactly yes. of, yeah. you know half man, half woman, yes, yes, or yes. dressing up like the other gender, mm -hmm. all, all these things. Um, Even fluid genders, gods that then, yes, you know, suddenly exactly. were the different gender, different yeah. animal. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that they have existed is no question. Yeah. Um, now, I do think that right now it has become somewhat of a trend. Mm. And I find it uh, a little bit dangerous because I think that it is almost... It's almost uncool, you know, to just be female assigned at birth and remain female for the rest of your yeah, life, for yeah. example. It's almost like, what, are you not, are you not woke? You know, are you not yeah. modern? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but I think that it has become so 
such a, such a strong part of our, our culture, not in the acceptance realm, but in the, you know, attack realm of like, of, you know, look, I have this and I have to battle that because I'm trans or because I'm gender mm -hmm. fluid. Um, that, and, and we see that young people, for example, are just changing their pronouns so often. Like close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's what I find a bit dangerous, I want to say, yeah. because um, if I'm a teenager now, And I have a phase where I feel like that my pronouns should be, you know, he, him, and then they, them. And this change nonstop, I don't know how helpful it is when that's not really, really what I'm feeling inside of me. Yeah. Uh, in my dream world, there would be an acceptance that is created. I would say like the acceptance that has been created at least in a city like Berlin for homosexuals. Yeah. You know, I know that it, that is not all over the yeah. world, but, you know, where it is totally known and everybody accepts and knows that this is, uh, you know, a way to go in your, yeah. in your sexuality. But it is not something that you're forced to, or not forced to, but, you know, that you keep on switching all yeah. the time. It's just something, if you feel it, it's fine. It's yeah. normal, you yeah. know, it's not abnormal. Yeah. And I wish that it was the same. If you feel that you're trans, if you feel that you're gender fluid, it's normal. It's not abnormal. It's normal and you can live it and be open about it and no one laughs about it. Mm. And it's true that when I was still at school, one would laugh about it. Yeah. Because we did have a trans kid in our class and people made fun of him. Mm -hmm. And that was horrible. And I'm, I think it's a great step forward that now when there's a trans kid in class, no one laughs about that. It's totally yeah. accepted. Yeah. But I do think that the it pendulum is... pendulum has swung too far in the yes, other direction. Yes, yeah. yeah. I do think that it is problematic that now people that I would say are actually not trans mm. think that they are trans and think that they are curing other problems that they have by changing Very their pronouns. Yes. And yes, it's, that's the big thing that... Yes. Yeah, and it's, especially as young children, mm -hmm. if you think, okay, now that I go with by they, them, everything is solved, it's not solved. I mean, I went through phases as a kid. I remember having this conversation with my mother. Yeah, maybe I like girls, you know, just because I thought it was almost like a cool, yeah. adventurous thing to say. And I remember she said, yeah, maybe you do. You know, you'll just find out. Yeah. And it was yeah. that was that. Yeah. There was no need to identify. There was no <laughs> need to say yeah. anything. And we all go through these identity searching yes. phases yes. and maybe it's even more helpful to do it by still holding on to who you are yeah. and not changing who you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree, yes, because I think that we live in a time where there are so many, you know, potential pathways to go forward in every aspect of your life, in your career aspect, in, in your relationship aspect, in your relationship model aspect. And we <laughs> just spoke about relationship models in our previous episode. And I think that, of course, the more opportunities you have, you know, we have the saying in German, die Qual der Wahl. Mm -hmm. So the more options you have, the harder it is to choose. And of course, the more confusion it encourages. And I think that For, especially when it comes to self-identification, the biggest question we all have basically our entire lives, but especially in those important years between maybe 12 and 30, who am I? You know, what, what, mm. who am I? Where do I belong? What is my, you know, my, 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 my destiny? And, and, and to add so many more questions to that, that maybe you wouldn't even have thought of questioning yeah. before. Yeah. I think that that is something that should not be taken lightly. For exactly. example, these, these yeah. kindergartens that we, you know, mm -hmm. this, these documentaries that we were watching about genderless kindergartens, that was yes, kind of something the idea. Like that. Yeah. Or, or, or families that try to raise their kids in a, in a genderless environment. Yeah. I mean, I understand and I, and I applaud the effort in the attempt. I mean, usually it is parents that truly are gender non-binary people mm. probably had a really rough time exactly. growing up yeah. in a very gender binary environment and then thought, I don't want to do that to my kid. Mm -hmm. I want to just leave it open for them. Now, the for me, truth still is that, I don't know the exact percentage, probably very easy to find out. Above 90% of people, I would dare say, I mean, maybe it's wrong, but I think significantly mm -hmm. above 9%, grow up feeling very much at home in the gender they were assigned at birth. And giving them uh, an outlet to question that does not help them. It doesn't enhance their lives yeah. to question yeah. when they're five years old, whether maybe today they want to wear a dress or not, or, you know, long hair, short hair, are you a girl, are you a boy, whatever. And you see it in these documentaries, the kids that are raised that way, they don't, you they're know... They're confused. They're confused, yeah. you know? I think the, the clue here is to be 
incredibly accepting yes. when something comes up to like especially in the role of the parent yeah. to listen to look out for the signs and encourage when you see those signs but to not impose not don't impose the whole thing upon them for example i mean i have two kids mm-hmm. i have a kid whose favorite color is pink and two boys i should say <laughs> i have, I have a, a son whose favorite color is pink who has a rainbow colored scooter with pink wheels who you know likes to choose glittery mermaids as uh, toys who has heart shaped pink sunglasses and yes we do have conservative friends who comment on that and who say why did he choose pink why is he wearing pink sunglasses why yeah. is he doing that and i tell them because he likes it you know yeah. don't stop questioning it because yeah. he likes it and i don't even i don't even discuss it with him yeah, like he course. wants the pink glittery mermaid he's okay. going to get the pink glittery mermaid yeah. now This is as far as it's gone. I mean, he's three years old. <laughs> Let's see where it's going to go. Yeah. But I'm going to be here accepting every move. This is totally his choice that he's yeah. doing. I should also say at the same time, he loves to climb. He, likes to, jump the, he yeah. loves to jump the trampoline. He loves monster trucks. You know, he loves all of that as well. Yeah. So I yeah. think I'm just creating the environment that he is seeking out. Exactly. And I think that's what we should do. I'm not now telling him, okay, you want to try this mini skirt? You know? yeah, of course, the assumption is that if you raise them in a gender non-binary environment, that that's not imposing. But mm-hmm. of course, the gender non-binary philosophy is just as, unfortunately, as yeah. imposing as a gender binary philosophy. Yeah. Both you know, philosophies yeah. go along with certain things that you do or don't do. Yeah. So exactly what you say is, but, but I'm trying to say is that playing with percentages or with likelihoods should also not be discounted most kids grow up in the you know majority way most kids grow up in the gender yeah. you know feeling like the gender that um, they were assigned at birth for example also i think that we found a very interesting balance or had found a quite interesting balance maybe with as you said sexual orientation you know, more people grow up heterosexual than homosexual however i would say that especially for example in the in a city like berlin it's so part of the ethos that homosexuality exists you know for some people that there would never be you know an idea to raise kids without sexual orientation or or you know try both genders in the beginning to find mm-hmm. out no you will you will feel it i think that um in these situations if someone grows up trans or grows up um, g- gender non-binary it's not something that I mean maybe I don't know but it, I don't think that it's something that you know you need to be told maybe you are that consider it maybe you right. could be I think it's something you feel so naturally that you at some point realize this is what I am of course it's good to have an available role model mm-hmm. that you're like ah I'm like I feel like this the same mm-hmm. way that you know when you are straight and in your uh, gender assigned in your birth assigned gender you also have role models like you see you know a man and a woman kissing and you're like oh this is nice you know i can imagine that someday yeah. when i'm an adult you know yeah. so of course that's nice but i don't think you need anyone you know asking you to question things yeah i, I agree with that of course as you said like i don't want to put that out there as a, a general fact because i am not mm-hmm. uh, trans and i'm not non-binary so i don't really know what that feels like and when you discover it but i also believe that people that really feel it inside of them feel it all by their own yes, on their own yeah, and yeah. i think just speaking uh, one second again about the role of the parent i think that what the parent should do is show what exists you know in for example through movies you know watch a movie like the danish girl with your yeah. kids at some point yeah. talk about that subject matter yeah, exactly. you know not necessarily relating it to them just like you will watch a movie where as you say a man and a woman kiss and you're also not going to say did you see that or did you feel when when they <laughs> yeah. did that it's just going to you know so that they yeah, know sure. that that exists watch a movie like broke back mountain you know yeah. watch all of those things yes. um But then the most important thing is, I think, instill self-confidence in them. Yes. Because uh, as, uh, someone who believes in themselves and ha- someone who feels self-confident and trusts themselves is going to feel okay communicating whatever new or unusual thing it is that they are feeling. Yeah. And instead of making them feel unsure, you know, yeah. be afraid. And that's also what I don't like, what I personally don't like about the whole pronoun thing. You know, it instills a bit of fear, mm-hmm. you know, make sure you don't do this mistake. Make sure you don't uh, call this person in the wrong way. It's just 
trust yourself, you know what is right for you, and I think a person like that has good preconditions and a good base to find their identity, their true identity. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, there, there, of course, so, well, I think that if I would also one time, once again, like to stress what you were stressing in the beginning, because, of course, I would say for a very long time, I consider myself much more of, you know, the, I would say, cliche progressive and compassion for all. And because I thought in a way that, um, that that was the political correct movement was the most likely movement to create tolerance for the mm -hmm. biggest group yeah. of people. Yeah. And um, I have to, since we're talking about political correctness, um, reference probably one of my favorite debates that I've ever watched which was this um, monk debate with um, Stephen Fry and Jordan Peterson on the side arguing against political correctness and then I forgot I think Michael Eric Dyson and I forgot the woman's name who was on the side arguing for political correctness mm -hmm. but it was the question was is political correctness a force of, for good in the world or something okay. like that or is yeah. political correctness good or bad and and for me, um, Stephen Fry made probably the most compelling argument in this conversation, which is not as so always it goes into like the moral structure of the person, like good people are for political correctness and more bigoted people are against it. And that is not the conversation that I feel is, is the, right, um, the right arena. Mm -hmm. What he was saying is we all want a world where people are kinder to each other, where everyone feels accepted, everyone is judged um, based on the merit of their character, not any, you know, um, outer characteristics or, or, you know, characteristics of sexual orientation or gender, but people are, you know, judged on their achievements, on, on their character, right? Mm -hmm. So we all want that. It's not the question of whether you want a world where um, sexual orientation plays a role mm -hmm. or not, you know? But the question is how to get there. And his argument was that political correctness is not a way to create a more tolerant world, but actually the consequences of political correctness is creating a less tolerant world. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that completely. I don't feel like since the rise of political correctness, us as a community have grown closer together and have been more accepting of our differences. If anything, it has exploded in a completely different direction. And that is not due to, or not exclusively, due to the fault of some people unwilling to accept progress or to acknowledge new, you know, forms of, 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 of um, living traditions or habits or orientations, but it is mostly because the people imposing the political correctness or imposing those um, new or, or educating the rest of society are so um, intolerant yes. in the way they I do think it. That's very and important. so exclusionary. Yeah, I think this is also where the, the cancel culture comes in. Yeah. Um, but an example that I find so striking when it comes to this excluding character yeah. of politically correct people is cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. and we were discussing that just a couple of yeah. days ago. Um, in Germany, there was just recently quite a famous case where a person wanted to speak at these Fridays for Future gatherings, which are basically gatherings that support, you know, saving the environment and raise awareness for climate change and all of that, and um, are, I would say, labeled as incredibly inclusive, yes. politically correct, you know, everyone is welcome type of gatherings. And there was a white person who had dreadlocks and he was forbidden to speak. He was literally cancelled off the program and he wanted to speak about climate change. He was not allowed to speak because he has dreadlocks and because this was considered cultural appropriation. Of African culture. Yes, of, of African culture. And he was, you know, he had to cut the dreadlocks or uh, not speak. And... Um, this, for me, really left such a bitter taste in my yeah, mouth yeah. because, first of all, I really must say that in that area, it's not like with the pronouns where I totally respect everything. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how if someone puts dreadlocks in their hair because they obviously admire that culture, because they obviously think it's beautiful or they think it's cool and they somehow identify with it, they yeah. identify with a part of that culture, how that is a negative thing. Because they're not doing it to mock it. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it to exclude it. They're doing it because they, they praise it. Because to they love it, it. To celebrate it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
and to call that negative is something that I don't understand. And then to cancel that person from speaking is something that I find yeah, yeah. wrong. And I mean, of course, so I totally agree with you. And then the other thing is that political correctness or the idea that forbidding people to say certain things uh, like in any way um, prevents them from forming those opinions in their minds, mm -hmm. I think simply is a, is a, is a fallacy. It's just a rational fallacy. I think quite on the contrary, if you scratch certain talking points or certain opinions from society, they very, very uh, healthily flourish like a tumor underground, get formed in far less, um, far less, I would say, healthy ways then, mm -hmm. and then create bubbles of real bigotry and real intolerance. Yeah. I think... But fringe opinions need to be thrust into the spotlight to quickly be talked out and debated mm -hmm. in the public sphere to therefore also, you know, rationally go against bigoted opinions. Yeah. But if the bigoted opinions are forbidden to even be formed, to even have a space to talk, mm -hmm. the idea that they're suddenly going to disappear or shrink, I think is wrong. And that's why I think it is perfectly... Uh, understandable and worrying that a consequence of the last few years of this incredible rise of woke to political correctness is an incredible worrying rise of really fringe right movements politically socially and 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 this and it's happening at the same time because once you you know push people in one direction the other direction is gonna wake exactly. up exactly because this is something that you said once and i found it very cool because you said the political spectrum is not a line but a circle yes and that the extreme left and extreme left actually uh, right. sorry extreme right and extreme left meet at the same point yes like, because it, that's where the circle closes right. meet at yeah. intolerance and, yeah. and you know and dog, dog dogmatic viewpoint yeah so but i just want to quickly discuss a little more this cultural thing yeah. because this is what i find the least understandable i i really don't get it you know it's also called racism now if you ask someone where they are from yes oh God, for yes. example and I, i don't know to me it was always a question that i anticipated with excitement you know that i was so happy about when someone said hey uh, you know you have brown curly hair Where are you from? Yeah. And I would always proudly say, yes, I'm half Greek. You know, my mother's from Greece. And my dad's half And then Greek. we would have a discussion about Greek culture and whatever. And it was always such a nice discussion. And now people are scared to ask that mm -hmm. because it's deemed politically incorrect. And I don't understand that side. The idea behind that, of course, as much of this originates, of course, in the United States, or, or I would say is, is kind of... Uh, Yeah, especially Western, strong yeah, in the United yeah. States, and the idea, of course, being that well, I'm American, you know. Yes, but I then where you're originally exactly, yeah. and I, I, I'm totally with you. And same yeah. thing also, for example, you know, uh, little boys are not allowed to dress up as uh, Native American. No, what is that called? Native Americans? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 Native Americans anymore because that's also cultural appropriation. But if I'm a little boy and I find that so cool because cool, I've yeah. watched, I don't know, Pocahontas, yeah. and I want to dress up like that, that's a way to praise that yeah, culture of course of course yeah yeah, yeah I mean it's, it's uh, how did Stephen Fry put it very very well that the left is illiberal in their desire for liberality mm -hmm. intolerance in their call for tolerance mm -hmm. and, and, and I totally understand that approach yeah. and that's right the, the problem and again I, I mean the, the that intentions are good the execution is bad some of the intentions are good yeah I think some of the intentions are also questionable Mm -hmm. I think like that, which one? I think that the general. I think for me the most worrying one is this idea. How can I put it in in like a short sentence? The idea that um, you are someone with your good and your bad qualities, and the way forward is everyone needs to accept you for who you are. So mm -hmm. not you have to change in order to become the best version of yourself, but even asking for change is is kind of a, a lack of acceptance, lack of tolerance mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Like basically everyone else needs to, uh, needs to Adhere affirm to you. you. Yeah. Needs yeah. to affirm your identity. And it's not just, by the way, identity in, in markers like gender and, and sexual orientation, which is a totally different, like just very affirming identity. For example, I'm also thinking of um, the fat pride movement, right? Mm -hmm. That's another big one that goes in that direction where instead of, 
saying, okay, maybe some people have met better metabolisms, therefore an easier time being fit than others. I'm definitely someone that, for example, has a harder time being fit. So mm-hmm. I firsthand know how it feels to not just naturally be a right. you know slim model type, body type. Um, however, to completely lie to yourself and say that, uh, you know, being of a certain, uh, I don't know, body index level onwards is less healthy than being underneath a certain body mass index to to BMI you mean, disregard that to fact. disregard yeah, that yeah. it it yeah. is what i mean yeah. like, like and it's, it's also self harm actually yeah. and yet yeah. it is deemed completely i mean it's one of the main i would say you know a uh, bigoted or 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 what is it then called i'm not sure what it's called then there i'm sure there fat is an ism fat shaming right fat shaming. to say like hey maybe you should lose some weight you're kind of increasing your re- your your risk for yeah. diabetes the right the same now. way that someone would say hey you look like you're bulimic or anorexic right exactly yeah, yeah. which also totally necessary yeah, exactly. in that situation and the interesting thing is you know famous uh, celebrities that have gone through that for example Adele mm-hmm. uh, you know has said in interviews that she was this image for body positivity yeah. because she was obviously overweight and was fine with it which is also cool you know feeling yeah. comfortable in your skin but then one day she made the decision to get healthy for herself Mm-hmm. and she lost this ton of weight yeah. and then she said suddenly people were angry at her yeah. because oh you're not for body positivity yeah. anymore yeah, yeah, yeah. and she was saying but I am like I created a positive body a healthier body yeah. this is body positivity yes. Yes. but it's as you say it's, it's this affirming yes. like, don't change you have to be exactly, exactly. the way you are yeah. Yeah. and right and I would so so that that's kind of a mentality and I think that this of course then um kind of Uh, d- dribbles down and um, not just to these like markers like body size and things like that but also to characters mm-hmm. like I've encountered especially in my generation I would say a lot of um people that have this now as as their general approach to life like you mm-hmm. know unapologetic like unapologetically being yourself doesn't mean being the best version of yourself you can be but it means accepting other people's unkindness or bitchiness mm-hmm. or or you know I don't know yeah. lack of punctuality or punctuality or whatever yeah. it has not become we try to be the best versions of ourselves yeah. and celebrate each other's achievements it has become we are completely fine with being the most comfortable version yeah. of ourselves and encouragement for self improvement is very often met with skepticism. anger skepticism exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and of course that is less a political correctness thing and more a consequence, a consequence of this of it. constant you're amazing just the way you are coddling of yeah. society yeah. okay so we're actually back home now uh, the first part of this episode was recorded backstage and now we've uh, arrived back home and we're going to finish recording this episode so uh, i think we'd just stopped where we were talking about the um ability or lack of ability or the fact that it's not common anymore to accept constructive criticism and for mm-hmm. constructive criticism to be viewed as something positive like this idea of bettering yourself and trying to improve your bad habits or maybe um suboptimal perspectives that the idea of improving those rather than just having other people accept them and you yourself accept them that, that is frowned upon yeah and i think that that leads us leads us quite well to the I would say last maybe point of of this episode that we're going to touch on and um, which is the fact that if all criticism is frowned upon anyway if this idea of self improvement is not celebrated but um viewed with skepticism then any criticism that does occur cannot occur in conjunction with okay now I criticize you and get better but it's it's basically I criticize you because you are uh, a lost cause Mm-hmm. which of course leads us into this idea of cancel culture that people cannot learn from their mistakes and get better but as soon as they make a mistake that is for whatever reason deemed um wrong or or deemed unforgivable they basically need to be completely uh, exorcised from society and they can never get a chance to get to, yeah. to, to get back into it kind of yeah what i find interesting about cancel culture are two things the first thing being that First of all, it's not even clear if they made the mistake. Mm-hmm. Canceling someone just happens when the accusation is made. There is no evidence just yet because it is basically said, yes, the accusation is bad enough. 
mm-hmm. and uh, is reason to cancel that person. This I find very problematic because we have now already lived through different, very high profile scenarios where the person that was canceled actually was not at fault. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not saying, you know, that if someone is at fault, we should be uh, not, not so harsh on him or anything like that. But first, it has to be clear that someone is at fault, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Benefit of the doubt. One Benefit of the, of the doubt. most important pillars of the justice exactly. system in and, a democracy. And maybe it's important to, you know, be quick about that, to not have this thing. I don't know, for example, someone is accused of uh, horrific rape and abuse and then, you know, have the trial three years later. Maybe we need to have a system and where these things can happen faster. But the solution to me definitely is not to have someone guilty and cancelled the day of the accusation. Mm, mm. So that's the one thing. And then the other thing that I find very difficult is that by cancelling someone, I feel like we don't address the crime. We don't address the actual problem. We address everything around that person. So for example, if it is an actor, let's say, suddenly uh, he needs to be taken out of the movie. You know, his mm-hmm. art needs to be eliminated. Mm-hmm. Or wasn't oh, yeah. there mm-hmm. this famous, um, I don't even remember his name, but this uh, famous um, black actor who did, like actually was... Oh, Bill Cosby. Right. Yes. Was it? Yeah, and then the show had to be, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like not, you can't even, cannot even watch it anymore yeah, or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So things like that. Yeah. Like, um, mm-hmm. This I find... Is interesting, you know. Also in classical music, we have that. Yes. I remember for uh, when I read the um, autobiography of, oh no, actually not auto, the biography of uh, Zubin Mehta, this Israeli conductor. Mm. There was a chapter towards the end where they said that um, up to that the point where he reintroduced it, the music of Richard Wagner oh, yeah. was not allowed actually to be played in Israel. I don't know if it was you know a legal thing or just yeah. not done. Yeah. 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 yeah, And he was the person that said, in case it is not clear to people, it's because Wagner is very much associated with uh, the Nazis in, in he, Germany. Yeah, I mean, rightfully associated with anti-Semitic uh, exactly. ideas. Exactly. So in, in Israel, his music was just simply not played. And Zubin Mehta, for example, was a person that said, art should not pay for what, you know, for example, the Nazis did. Mm. And Wagner's music is beautiful, and he played it. And he said he played it once after the concert, um, just a couple of minutes of it. Mm-hmm. And yes, many people in the audience left and were mm-hmm. disgusted, mm. but some stayed. And now mm. we're at a point where it is being played again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are two, I think, very big and, and separate points. Um, the second one to me is more debatable, like, yeah. you know, than the first yeah. one. The second one, I think that, um, you know, th- yeah, it, it's also a matter of, for example, uh, the like Roman Polanski movie mm-hmm. situations. Mm-hmm. Um he, you know, he he didn't stand trial. I think literally he's not allowed back to the USA because he avoided his trial yeah. and now makes makes movies in Europe. And 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 it's this question of you know, do you watch the art? Do you not watch the art? Um, is the art somehow tainted or tarnished in some way because mm-hmm. of the person? So I mean that that is a super interesting debate and one where, although I I would I tend to fall on the like separating the art from the crime, if you will. Right. And yeah. um, I do also respect if people say something like, you know, this is, I cannot enjoy this in any way anymore, yeah. provided that the person is actually guilty, of course, right? I mean, of course. Yeah, which, yeah. which is which is a bit of a different thing. But than- I also find it interesting, yes, okay, I cannot enjoy watching it anymore, or maybe not putting, for example, an actor in any new movies, but also when it goes back, yeah. you know, it's yeah, yeah. kind of like eliminating everything yeah. that this person yeah. has done. It's t- like trying to wipe his existence off yeah. the face no, no, of the earth. No, no, of course, that, that is... I find that pretty extreme. N- absolutely. No, and, and I think that there is a difference between when I say you don't watch the art, I think more from the perspective of a subjective consumer. Right. Say the movies exist and you choose yeah. not to watch them. Which is absolutely now, exactly. Choice, when, yeah. when we talk about a more institutionalized approach of, of, of erasing someone, I agree with you that that is not okay. Yeah. Because it's part of history, it's part of, you know, it does make um, the art kind of retrospectively of a different quality. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. just produced by a person who did something yeah. horrible. Yeah. Um, now, the first thing that you mentioned, which is this uh, instant um, kind of, witch hunt on people that have been it's, it's literally 
modern day witch hunting. It's someone saying, I heard this person mumble we weird words in the hut. And before this person can say anything, the pyre is already built and the, you know, the church is already in full swing to, uh, con to, um, to, to, to accuse this person of witchcraft. And then it's like, ooh, maybe you have a pimple somewhere on your skin. And if you do, then you are a witch. And mm -hmm. it's literally nothing to do with, you know? So I do feel that it is very comparable. Just, of course, modernized and, and a bit more civilized. The consequence is not actual death. The consequence is, mm, I would say, an, an inability to make a living in your field and an inability to 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 ever get to, to ever separate yourself from the accusation basically that's what it is um well yeah and uh, as you said inability to make a living i mean is, you yeah, lose yeah. your existence no, yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah so for me the absolute biggest problem is what you mentioned the fact that this idea of innocent until proven guilty give the person the benefit of the doubt has just completely disappeared yes and it has completely disappeared Quite consciously, I mean, this this slogan that came out, believe all women in, in the Me Too movement, it's such a misguided idea. Yeah. Because it has a good origin because, yes, of course, for a long time, victims, I mean, women or men, I don't, don't want to, you know, separate the genders yeah, there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. let's just say abuse victims. Believe all victims. Were, or, yeah. or believe all accusers is what it basically says is believe all accusers. Exactly. But, but I mean, I think it's a, it's a good thing, of course, to build a platform where victims are believed because for a long time, you know, victims were coming forward and it was mm. like, no, 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 hush, hush. Let's mm -hmm. not, uh, let's cover it up. So I understand the positive origin of it, mm -hmm. but I find that it has taken a very negative turn. No, and, and to be honest, I mean, I, I would be a, a bit more critical on it that I understand the idea of, you know, give um, an accusation a serious, you know, investigation. That I, That's what, what, yes, what, what should exactly. happen. Give it a serious investigation. But the idea that it should be take all victims seriously. Take all victims yeah, seriously. Take all investigate seriously. all yes. accusations is yeah. what it should be. Don't brush off anything. But now we're on the other side where before, it, you know, no accuser was believed. It was just no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Now the accuser basically is the more powerful person, which is very scary because Someone can just accuse and destroy another person's life, literally with zero foundation. With zero foundation, and the, exactly, absolutely. And um, I also think that it the the other issue that can happen with this, like you know, uh, in like the the the, the standard that gets you cancelled, or the or the standard that is considered inaccept not non acceptable anymore. Um, gradually is getting less and less attainable. Mm -hmm. Where now people that I would say are the absolute epitome of a woke person, then maybe one time write one wrong word in a Twitter post or uh, something is uncovered from 16 years ago when they were a teenager and suddenly they are then, you know, uh, the target of, of cancellation. And so, which means that if they cannot... Um, live up to the standard, who can? So basically yeah. the truth is that yeah. the standard that we are aspiring to is not a realistic standard. And this idea of cancellation is very much already, I think, has been weaponized and yes, has been, and you know, I, I think, quite consciously weaponized. Yeah, I, th I think there is also a reason why it's called cancel culture mm. because it has literally become a, a cultural movement to denounce people, to cancel them, you know, to go online and say, that person said that, unacceptable. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not his friend anymore. I won't follow him anymore. You know, th things like yeah. that. Um, and I think that is very dangerous because it instills fear. It instills fear of saying the wrong thing. Oh, yeah. It um, kind of has, you know, unspoken rules of what you are allowed mm -hmm. to say, of how you are, uh, the way you are allowed to act. I find that it takes away freedom. And absolutely. And I'm, I'm absolutely not someone, you know, who wants to speak in an outrageous, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, whatever it is. Provocative way. Provocative in any way. Yeah, racist, sexism, whatever it is way. Not at all. I, I think I'm someone who actually, in my everyday life, I am very politically correct, mm. you know, just in, in the way that I act. Mm. But I find it worrying mm -hmm. that even someone like me now has to be very careful yeah. how I yeah. word things and what I say, even though usually my antennas are out anyway, and I am yeah. very careful anyway. Yeah. 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 But that, it, that I really have to be careful because I might be cancelled, you know, I yeah. might be... Your uh, reputation might be damaged. Exactly, yeah. 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 Yes, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And um, I think that 
the flip side of it, which is this, because I think that, you know, there, there are so many different, I would say, sub, um, sub movements to this whole, for example, I remember when um, the George Floyd uh, yeah. murder happened, right? The next day, everyone would put up a black square right. on their Instagram, yeah, 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 yeah. which is, I get the gesture, right? Yeah. But then people that wouldn't put up the black square, not doing something, mm -hmm. could be grounds for being considered less um, compassionate for the situation or, or less in support. I actually have like a personal story about that. A friend of mine who lives in America, she didn't put up the black square. Yeah. She like did something, I don't know, funny or whatever. She basically just was, I think, eating something and it was black. And she, she in a, like in an Instagram story, yeah. said something like Black Lives Matter. Or I mm, think that's what mm. everyone was writing, right? And she told me that she was flooded yeah. with messages saying, are you crazy? This is not funny. You know, yeah. post the black square. What, what are you thinking? And she was yeah. also in a minority group. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, yeah. th th this, th this starts becoming a problem because it, it, it creates um, pressure to be inauthentic in order to be left alone. Yes, in and, order and to also, even be considered and also, a respectful person. Yeah, and, and, all, and, and also not doing something is considered already a problem. Yeah. Like, like, like just, you know, not um, g publicly going and declaring your um, absolute, you know, undying uh, need for forgiveness because you're white and you've got privilege. You know, uh -huh, like this, uh -huh. this thing like, yeah. what? You know? Yeah. Like, and so I think another thing is it takes away from the actual very necessary and maybe also difficult dialogue that we need to have mm. in order to solve the problems because I yeah. feel like these solutions uh, which are not actual mm -hmm. solutions are um, you know trying to solve something but of course not at all doing that I mean posting a black square posting a hashtag absolutely going on the on a some kind of riding on some kind of wave that is in right now mm doesn't solve anything, you know, just because I've posted the black square doesn't mean that I've done anything else. To support anybody. To, yeah, to yeah. support this black people matter, uh, black, lives movement, matter. black lives yeah. matter mm. movement. Yeah. Um, yeah. But rather, I think it's it would be much more important to have real conversations yeah. where you get into the deep of it, where you really think about context, about everything, into the details. And yes, that is much harder and much more uncomfortable. Absolutely. But it is so much more helpful and yeah. so much more effective. Yeah. Yeah. And I think right now we're kind of using the cop out, like the easy way out and trying to make ourselves feel like we are so politically correct mm -hmm. when actually what, what we're doing, I think the core of it is not political correctness. Yeah. It's just a facade and of I, And I think that I would even go one step further and say that because not only are we just making ourselves feel better with this like, you know, virtue signaling act mm -hmm. of I'm so, you know... Yeah. Uh, supporting black lives because I posted something on Instagram, but because we discourage the dialogue that could potentially lead to a bettering of the situation. Exactly. I think that yeah. actually in this specific arena, political correctness does the opposite of what it professes to do. It actually um, inhibits an improvement of minorities yeah. because you can't cannot honestly discuss yeah. why certain situations or why certain lack of privilege exists where it exists yeah. because any of course the first thing you would have to do is kind of um i would say have a very sober perspective on whose responsibility is it mm -hmm. and of course the first thing that would happen you would say is okay there is respon there is historical responsibility there are, you know but of course there is also responsibility in the people that live through the lack of privilege mm -hmm. and that perspective in itself that someone who is in a position of lack of privilege might have to get themselves out of it um, in order, you know, and it's not just a matter of compassion, but it's also a matter of, you know, having to get this motivation. That perspective is is very dangerous <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To, to, to discuss in, a, in, in an open debate. And I, I've also found that there have been many instances, and it has happened recently now in Berlin, actually at a university, and mm -hmm. I know it has happened many times in, in, in America anyways already, but the trend has come here now, which I found worrying where speakers have um, not 
in, in the end, not been allowed to speak at yeah. a university. And this idea that there are certain opinions that are deemed that unacceptable, that they cannot be discussed at a university, mm -hmm. I think that that is an incredibly dangerous trend. Um, and, and, and even the perspective that someone at an institution of learning says that I'd rather not have to contend with a set of ideas that I completely disagree with rather than have an excitement to disprove those ideas. That the perspective has gone away from, okay, let's, let's debate it out because until it's we fear find instilled. It's fear yeah. instilled. And, and I mean, that, that then, you know, ties into this idea of trigger warnings and safe spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, this idea that, I mean, you, I'm okay with the trigger warning, give a trigger warning. That's fair. You know, everyone can leave who might be triggered by that but don't stop the discussion altogether give as many trigger warnings as you want i mean yes that that, that is i mean on one level yes give the trigger yeah, warnings exactly and, and, and the then keep talking, yeah. on another level this idea that an adult needs to be warned of a potential opinion that might you know uh, make him or her a bit yeah. uncomfortable is also a sign that i would say is not a step in the right yeah. direction i think um I mean, if you agree that we've basically covered the cancel culture topic. And I would like to just add one more thing that I just find partly ridiculous if I were not afraid that this might become a mainstream opinion mm -hmm. um, is the trend to cancel historical figures in the past that have like yeah. up to now That's been what hailed I mean as with, heroes. Yeah, no, with canceling the entire existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Like Columbus. Right, I like mean, yeah. canceling uh, George Washington. George Washington, yeah. Because yeah. he had slaves. I yeah. mean, let's not forget that, that he also wrote, you know, partly a, a document that has influenced yeah. um, the last 200 years because like no we, other. Because we always have to put everything into the historical context. And yes, of course, we should condemn slavery. slavery. Yeah. And of course, it's not good that he had slaves, but in the historical context that he lived, as horrible as it is, that was kind of not what kind was, of it was. I mean, it had it been the norm much for the norm, thousands yeah. of years, and, and it doesn't take away from his brilliance in other areas. So I think yes, we should condemn that he did have slaves and that he didn't have the brilliant idea to be the first person to say enough, enough <laughs> is enough. You know, yeah. okay, that is a valid point. But everything else that he did was still incredible. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or this idea that now, for example, Beethoven needs to be scrutinized because of the yeah. fact that he is a white male and maybe there had been someone of a minority at the time that would have had a bigger career if he... I mean... Yeah, and what, wasn't it this, Oxford? Oxford yes. University that said that they will stop teaching about yeah, Beethoven? Yeah, I mean... I don't know if they actually... I don't know, know I don't know. I mean, an article. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, there, there is this one other... One other mini story that I remember that I heard that I felt a bit confused by, I have to also say, and, and, and I, I, would, I would like to research on that a bit more before I like say that's what happened, but a person who was studying law in Germany, in the south of Germany, just, just a, a friend of a friend, and I met this person at a, con at a dinner, and we stru struck up a conversation, and um, it was exactly around this Me Too debate, and, and, this, and I asked him, from a strictly legal perspective, where does um, sexual predation begin? Uh -huh. Because, you know, there were these stories about long hugs and right. the stories yeah. about, you know, when, when, when someone is um, inebriated because of alcohol and then consents to having yeah, yeah, sex. Yeah, 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 is yeah. that already, mm -hmm. you know, all these. And, and I was wondering, what, the, what does it actually say, you know, black, black and white in, in, in the law book? And I remember I asked him and he said, you know, um, it's not taught this. The, we're not we're not taught about rape in the classroom, about about the legal side of rape, because um, it's such a like minefield topic. The professors have decided not to teach it anymore uh -huh. because basically, um, you know, if they but say do we know where it was before. I, I, I didn't continue the conversation because I, I because I, says, I, I do think that uh, I, I would be you know, I find it very hard to find a definition because I do believe that there is no clear line. Every single case is different. Exactly, but, but I mean, I was wondering, there must be a legal standard. There cannot not be a legal standard um, that we're orienting or orientating ourselves towards, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and I remember he said that the, because if the professors were to say something like, I'm just giving an example, um, in order for sexual molestation to be there, there has to be touch, for example, right. right? 
And someone in the, in the, in the student, in the uh, body of students disagrees and says, well, I've experienced sexual abuse verbally, right? And then they start getting into a discussion. That professor might be yeah. um, well, cancelled to use or, or, you know, might get in trouble, yeah. basically. Well, I so it's not being taught yeah. anymore. I, I mean, that I do, is I tragic, think, if I, that's true. Yeah, I do think that this whole when does rape start is very difficult. And it's super difficult, yeah. I also think yeah. that there is no clear line where a teacher can say that's when it is, no, that's but, when it but, isn't. But I do think the point that you said that, you know, a student can, can just say I'm offended by what you said and thereby cancel a professor is not just with this subject, with any yeah, subject. Yeah, yeah, but, but the point I'm dangerous. making is that within the arena of Me Too, where we are redefining, you know, and, and maybe understanding better that, as you said, rape is not something as simple as penetration, yes yeah, or no, yeah. but it is something that can begin, that does begin far earlier. It's, it's difficult to define. The most important thing to to address in that, in order to be able, as you said before, to not have to cancel these people culturally or socially, but have a legal pathway towards addressing the situation, is addressing the legal the legal foundation of it, mm -hmm. to making laws or trying, which, which well, is, you know, I mean, is, I think is there is trying a, to make laws a legal foundation that and are, that's consent. That's always, you know, legally what people say. Was it co consensual or was it non consensual? Oh, right. As, as soon as something is non consensual, but I'm saying that if it's illegal in the sexual right. arena, right, right, and 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 I would totally agree with that idea. But I'm saying that someone who studies law, Should that's know. the place yeah, yeah, where yeah. the discussion needs to happen, of course. Yeah, not yeah, the yeah. place where the discussion is avoided. Yeah. Of course, generally we are avoiding discussions and yeah. not encouraging discussions with all of this yeah. cancelling which is also um, what I wanted to get to before um, because at the end of the episode we always say two stories about each mm. other and this is not really a story about you but it's a story about someone in our family so mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that it would still be fitting um, because I remember that our father was telling us that he signed up for a project that takes place in Germany which is called Germany Talks and ah. it's a project where um, kind of liberal mm -hmm. people, which uh, would be our father, are paired up with uh, more extreme right-wing people that vote the party that in Germany is the extreme right-wing party. And they are encouraged to meet up over coffee and just exchange views mm -hmm. because the founder of this project believes that that's how problems are solved. If you just meet the people, understand their fears, present mm -hmm. them your side. Mm -hmm. And I found that so interesting, mm -hmm. you know, to instead of say, oh, you're stupid mm -hmm. and I don't understand your views. How can you be so dumb mm -hmm. to not go down that path, but mm -hmm. to actually see them as people mm -hmm. and start exchanging. And this to me is an example of what needs to be done in every single category of, mm -hmm. you know, potential canceling. Meet people at eyes level. How do you say that? You know, same, mm -hmm. same eye I level. Know, know, yeah. um, and then discuss and give them your points, listen to them and try to find a common ground. I think this is how these very big problems can be solved. Absolutely. And I think that this has to happen on all the different um, dimensions dim dimensions within society. So on the, on the personal front, that, you know, you have a conversation with someone you disagree with within your family or within your friend group. And, yeah. But then, you know, the higher up you go, these conversations need to be had also in a kind of representative way. For example, in a university. Yeah. In a, and to you me, know, you know, speaking about in media and main yeah. media. Yeah, Where course. these conversations are not happening. Are not happening, yeah. And that, I mean, by the way, to me, speaking about wokeness and, you know, defining what is woke and so mm. woke, to me, that is woke. Willing to meet someone that you completely disagree with, willing to listen to him and, you know, kind of like as you would in a debate setting, yeah. right? Yeah. Willing to be open yeah. to hear his points and react to them respectfully. Yeah. To me, that is what, not just denouncing and cancelling yeah. someone simply because you don't agree with them. And, and, and it, to, to use the, the term from before, and in all fairness, as unimaginable as it seems in, with some viewpoints, when confronted with some viewpoints, give the person the benefit of the doubt. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Which is what you said with yeah. listening. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. listening doesn't just mean listening and waiting to make your argument. No, no. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, the super um, old, <laughs> you know, Vialoros idea of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. A, a skill that we've lost, and not only that we've lost, but that we've become uh, skeptical of, yes. which is really dangerous. Yes. And I would say that 
the story that uh, the story it's not really a story but i remember it was a conversation we were having maybe some months ago um around the uh, corona pandemic and the vaccination um debates that were happening around us where i remember you and i kind of who again i mean we i would say fall quite uh cliched into like a kind of liberal moderate um type of, of thinking you know yes, yeah. yeah also the way we grew up you know um and and that you and i kind of you know were sitting in in our in our music room and hushed saying to each other do you also feel that you cannot speak to mm-hmm. the true nuance of this con- of this topic in a public space mm-hmm. that you know that that you kind of you feel like the 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 amount It's of resistance you yeah. get for any opinion that does not fall completely into the opinion of the woke camp is just not worth the discussion you know mm-hmm. like and i remember we we're saying yeah you have to pick your moment to have a more nuanced discussion yeah. because people that usually think so nuanced and kind of um you know multifaceted in, in conversations in this situation just denounce any type of nuance. Yeah. And this idea, I mean, when people like you and me who are confident and not, you know, unwilling to engage in a debate, start searching our words and start um, you know, questioning whether it is worth presenting an alternative or slightly nuanced viewpoint within any setting, I think that that is a a very worrying and good indication that you know self censorship has began yes. has begun yeah. and currently you know we're not at all at a level of censorship as in um you know past d- regimes of the gdr or mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. we're not there but i do have to th- i do think about the fact that you know those trends don't begin from one day to the next suddenly you cannot say anything anymore you know it has to be a very gradual and almost imperceptible uh development mm-hmm. and that currently we are living through a time where self censorship has become a noticeable influence in our everyday lives yeah and i would say that um That's worrying. it's it's worrying and and ev- anyone who's interested in true freedom of not just speech but freedom of thought and you know freedom to think something wrong and then change your mind yeah, just also discussion exactly just, yeah. i think should, should Uh, become aware of the fact that doing nothing is maybe not an option anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a very nice way to end this episode. <laughs> doing nothing is not an option, people out there. Um, <laughs> so yes, I think this has become a very long episode yes. now, but it's a, it's a long subject. So yeah. these are our thoughts on woke culture and everything that comes with it. Well, parts of what comes yeah. with it. I think we could do like four more episodes true, on true. that. Parts of what, yeah. <laughs> And we will see you again, or uh, talk to you again, (laughs) next week. Lots of love. Bye. Bye. You're listening to The Sister Trill with Danai and Kiveli.